My name is Julie Hausch, SCA Knowledge Development Manager. Our final talk for this iteration of Coffee Retail Summit is Responsible Design Strategies. And we're joined by Rhiannon Laurie, Workplace Sustainability and Wellbeing Design Strategist with Gensler in London. At Gensler, Rhiannon helps promote responsible design at every stage of the design process and embed it into company culture. Before speaking with her, we only had a small idea of what sustainability might mean in the context of workplace design. And it's Rhiannon's passion driving us towards a healthy, carbon positive, circular economy future that makes this talk really special. Please welcome Rhiannon Lori. Rhiannon, hand over to you and take it away. Thank you. Um, I will share my slide. Okay, so yes, Julie's just done my introduction. So um, I'm a sustainability and well-being workplace strategist at, at the global design firm Gensler. So I I work with with a, a wide range of clients to help kind of embed sustainability and well-being into their workplaces through a, a, a wide variety of strategies. Um, and I've also added my my contact email. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, so I'll be going through three main things today. So first of all, what makes a design responsible? And then looking at specifically responsible material and product attributes. And then what it, what you can do to create a di a didactic or educational space to help your building or you, um, your building users or occupants uh, learn about sustainability and well-being. So first, starting with what makes a res uh, design responsible. So uh, first of all, designing for planetary health, and this includes environmental sustainability, promoting biodiversity, and helping to regenerate natural systems so that we're not uh, utilizing too much raw materials or, or any new raw materials. And we're, we're just keeping uh, the materials that are already in use um, in use. And then design also for human health, which includes socially equitable sourcing, designing for health and well-being, and also inclusive design, making sure that the design can be used by all. And so all of these together uh, would create a responsible design. So if we think about specifically materials and, we, and how we would source those materials responsibly, um, the first thing you, you would look at is sustainable sourcing. So sourcing products with verifiable claims from manufacturers that are actively aiming to reduce the product's adverse environmental health and impacts. Sorry, environmental and health impacts. Um, and then uh, looking at sustainable content of the products or materials. So how much of it is recycled? Is it sustainably harvested? Are there any bio-based materials within the, the um, product? And, and then the circular eco economy. So avoiding um, any waste going to landfill and keeping products in use for as long as possible and closing that loop and then making sure that the materials are, are healthy so that there's no hazardous chemicals um, that are affecting human health in it in any way and so these are all the different uh, kind of strategies or attributes that go along with each of these uh, categories that we'll look into in more detail and just to kind of go into a bit more depth uh, into the circular economy, uh, the goal what, when it comes to circular economy, the goal is obviously to minimize or completely um, avoid any waste going to landfill whatsoever. So um, if this circle is kind of a material or product that's in use before specifying any new materials or products. So before specifying this product, 
there are a, are a number of things we can do. So we can refuse to, to specify that product. Maybe there's another way. Maybe you don't need to specify something, you know, really kind of figure out a, a way you could do it without the product, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to achieve. You could rethink how to build your your space. Maybe you can use a different a different type of material, or you know, really think of a different option. Or you can just try and use less of it. So those are the three things that you should do before specifying a new material. And then once you have specified, or once you're using anything that's already in you. So reuse would be your first go-to option in terms of specifying materials. So reuse something that already exists. And then if you can't reuse um, reuse straight away without doing any refurbishment, you could repurpose, remanufacture, refurbish or repair. So those are your next kind of options in terms of um, impact. And then your kind of last resort would be to recycle the material or product. And then before going to landfill, you could can uh, recover energy from the product. This usually involves burning materials like through combustion, um, which is not the best option, but it's it's still a way to recover something from the material that's already uh, in use. And then the ultimate goal, as, as mentioned, is that we want to avoid landfill completely. So I, I've put this in pink because it, that that affects human health because avoiding landfill obviously keeps any plastics or harmful chemicals out of our, our water systems. And also uh, avoiding landfill um, creates more jobs because it puts greater focus on repurposing, remanufacturing, refurbishing, all of these things that provide um, communities with, with more jobs. So then moving on to uh, responsible product and material attributes. So what you should be looking for when you're sourcing um, or specifying materials and products. So there's 12 different things that we'll go through and I've, I've kind of color coded them as to whether or not they it, it, it's focusing on um, supporting environmental design or, or health and well-being. So first of all, recycled content. Um, obviously, the, the more percentage of recycled content that you can have in your products, the better. Um, and just, just ensure that you're kind of reusing as much as you can of what already exists. Um, and this is a good option when it comes to uh, cr how, creating durable materials. So for example, this recycled glass aggregate in Terrazzo countertop. So it's, it's a nice way of, of having kind of a responsibly sourced option that is durable. Uh, Bio-based content. So um, it helps reduce the amount of carbon that's required to produce a product and is often more biodegradable than syn synthetic materials. So uh, non-hazardous chemicals, um, the, the Institute of the IL ILFI, the Institute of Living Futures, no, the International Living Futures Institute, sorry. Um, they have a, a red list um, online that, that should be kind of avoided. So you can check that out and just ensure that your products don't have any of the, those um, red list materials uh, in them. And also they have a great database that you can look for uh, materials that, that have this red list free certification. Um, but yeah, just the idea is that all the all products are completely free of, of any hazardous chemicals. Low emitting materials. So um, pro products undergo th third party testing to determine the amount of VOCs uh, emitted from the product as it cures and off gases. Um, and so the goal is for 
to specify products that are low in these VOCs, uh, and it, it applies especially to to paints um, and any coatings that you might be using within your space. Uh, any kind of ele electrical goods that you're specifying, you should be looking for energy efficient products, um, and that includes LED bulbs or anything with a high efficiency rating. Uh, so that, yeah, the construction industry and the commercial industry have a, a huge uh, impact on waste generated, um, not just in the UK, but across the world. So this is, this is a, a, a place where we really need to make headway in terms of how much we're reducing waste. And so uh, specifying recyclable or biodegradable products is a great way to achieve that so that they can be reused at the, at the end of their uh, use. Um, specify products or systems that can be disassembled and reused. Uh, so this could be demountable partitions or any products really and a great way to do this is by avoiding any glues and for example there's this carpet that you can install with removable pressure sensitive adhesives instead of um, having any kind of glue which makes it difficult to uh, reuse or disassemble. Uh, a lot of suppliers offer take-back programs. So once um, you've finished, once a carpet or a ceiling tile or any product has, has reached the end of, of use, the end of life for which you're using it, uh, suppliers often will take back those materials and then um, recycle them into new products. So low embodied carbon, this is the amount of carbon that a product uh, uses what in, ter in terms of production, transportation and installation is um, reported on their environmental product declar declarations so if you're specifying any materials or products look at be sure to check out their environmental product declaration and kind of get an idea for for whether or not it has a kind of a higher or lower global warming potential Locally sourcing so this is something that affects both the environment and um, kind of local local economies um, but the closer you can have the material sourced the lower the embodied carbon in terms of transportation to site and this diagram at the top is from the living building challenge and they uh, to achieve certification they state that at least 20 percent of the material source should be from within 500 kilometers of the site Social equity and supply chains. Um, there are a number of raw and composite materials that are at, at higher risk of embedded slavery. So those should be avoided. And also um, designers and contractors can, can actively promote social equity by specifying from uh, minority uh, owned businesses or female owned businesses or disabled owned businesses. And then finally, sustainably or responsibly sourcing. So just looking out for these third party certifications that, that, ver that verify the sustainable sourcing and manufacturing practices. So just a few things on how to create didactic spaces or spaces that help us to learn about sustainability and well-being design. Try and tell the, the story of the product. So, you know, even if it's just with a simple label, explain where, where the product has come from and tell that story as to maybe what the impact is of using it and, and help users to learn that it might be better to try and reuse something than to specify something new. And so this is an example from one of the projects I worked on and we 
we added labels to the back of, of a lot of the furniture just to tell the story as to where we you know where we'd found it and how old it was and that by reusing it we were saving x amount of of carbon so yeah so provide some some really clear point of decision signage i think recycling is a, a really tough thing for some people especially when you're when you're pushed for time it's really hard to kind of figure out where things are going so the the clearer that you can be with signage in terms of uh, what to do with waste, um, the better. And showcase your progress. It doesn't need to be on using digital signage, even if it's just, you know, if you're in a coffee shop and you're, you're kind of tracking your progress that you saved X amount of waste this month compared to last month, or just kind of show that you yourself are tracking it and, and show your customers or employees how, how well you're doing and, and how that compares to others. Kind of gamifying the your progress. And then make responsible design prominent in the space and, and really promote the use of natural, natural materials um, responsibly sourced natural materials uh, and, that, and making a space kind of more focused on connecting employees or users with nature. It, it doesn't necessarily have to involve just, just plants. It can be using something like cross-laminated timber, like in this space, um, or promoting good daylight across the space, um, or even just having the staircase be more prominent than than the elevator so that people are, are, see the stairs first and and um kind of choose that active mode of mode of getting upstairs instead of the elevator so yeah that that's all from me um and again if you have any questions or are interested in having any consulting about uh, designing for sustainability or health and well-being in your spaces please contact me at rhiannon underscore laurie at gensler.com yeah thank you thank you so much Rhiannon. Um, do you have time for actually a couple of questions yeah a couple that came of your um i'm curious um this is something you do for workspaces, like this sort of analysis and then these recommendations and helping design and build out. Uh, would you recommend if, if I'm like a retailer either looking to renovate my space or if I'm, I'm looking to build a new coffee shop space, for example, um, do you have like a guideline of like, does this cost more than a normal construction or how much would, should I budget for considerations like being more sustainable like this? Ah, <sighs> difficult question. Um, it, it, oh. it, it really varies uh, and it kind of, it would depend on how ambitious you want to be. You know, there are so many different levels of, of sustainability and designing for health and well-being, and um, they all cost a different level. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, being sustainable doesn't cost more than just designing normally especially if it's kind of the baseline level versus the most ambitious or industry leading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it definitely do shouldn't cost you more to just consider the basics. Great. I know. Okay. I think people oftentimes are like, well, it must cost more, but um, that's great. It doesn't have to cost more. It doesn't, it doesn't always to. cost more. <laughs> that's great. Um, and I'm also curious about um, when we met before your talk, you were talking about how, your role in particular has developed over time. Um, can you speak a little bit to that about, you know, the progression? I think people are getting more and more interested in well-being design spaces. Like, how have you seen um, that space grow for you or for the industry as overall for the past few years? Yeah, so uh, COVID has definitely been a huge part of this. Um, Pre-COVID, definitely cl clients Clients were focused on health and well-being of occupants, mm -hmm. uh, much more than sustainability, for sure. 
Uh, I think that's because, you know, it, it directly impacts the people and it's a lot more kind of tangible in terms of designing the space, you know, certain space types that you would include or, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to relate to than sustainability. Um, and that definitely increased a lot because of COVID and everyone's huge focus on designing for health, especially. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, subsequently the world's focus on global health also came into this, meaning that clients are also asking for sustainability to be the, at the forefront of their designs. And, and the, the difference between pre-COVID and now in terms of how, many clients are asking for sustainable designs it's it's night and day <laughs> um which is super everyone wants exciting. to talk about it now right yeah super exciting that's great times. that's what we want to hear um awesome how about um i think everyone will probably rush they i mean i would i think we'd all love to work with you but if you know outside the uk or if we're in other markets is there a way to recommend, you know, is there a resource that you could recommend if I'm looking to find someone like you or how would I, you know, because I think some of this stuff can get overwhelming of like, okay, I have my checklist that you just provided us of ways to consider um, designing a space or repurposing a space, but it's also, also nice to get an expert like yourself in. So um, are there da other databases or how would you recommend finding someone like yourself in maybe another market? Um, yeah how to find other people like me and other markets um well I, I mean i would just start find you really yeah <laughs> just, i don't want to send anyone 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 yeah. else yeah. um no i would just say depending on the market just just go to whichever company's website and just look up the sustainability uh specialists or strategists there's so many and anything that has the word sustainability in it yeah, yeah. <laughs> tends to do the job yeah. um and then or, or just on linkedin i'm sure that there's a ton of people on there with, with the same kind of background and skills um and um oh databases yeah there's there's a a, a few different databases uh depending on which region you're in. So for example, in the US, uh, Material material Bank or Materials Bank um, and Mindful Materials. Uh, those are two great resources where you can kind of source things and, and filter materials by location, by sustainability certification. You know, they have some great filters that you can look and, and understand kind of much more about each of the products yeah um and then if you're in in europe uh, it would be kind of cradle to cradle or ecomedes um declare label lots of different databases out there um i don't want to exclude any if i've forgotten them so <laughs> and many it's a short list yeah, yeah it's not an exhaustive <laughs> list i put you on the spot too um and I it might be this might feel like a silly question a bit, but I'm very curious. Like, is there a material that is probably the worst to work with in your experience? Really, like, just don't please stop using this material. Like, um, gosh. well, <laughs> I mean, the ones that you shouldn't be using are pro probably it's not legal anymore, or it, you know, like asbestos. Obviously, yeah. like that's the starting point. <laughs> mm -hmm um but other than that uh well one huge one is polystyrene or i think you call it something different in the u.s um styrofoam styrofoam yeah yeah especially when it comes to having it touch anything you eat for sure mm. so yeah anything that involves styrofoam is in there <laughs> which is a big deal with coffee right it's like that's what we're doing Food. Yeah, coffee. so if it relates to food, yeah, n no styrofoam. But but honestly, the the what I mentioned in the presentation is it's the red list material. So anything mm -hmm. that's on that list of red of red list materials, you you just shouldn't be using or just yeah. trying to avoid at all, all costs, really. Great. 
I know. And we'll link that in the chat too for everyone watching. Um, is there a material actually on that on the opposite end of that that you really love? I mean, um, the earlier image you had in your slideshow of the recycled glass terrazzo, I was like, oh, I didn't know. Like that's actually so beautiful. I'd love to see that in a space. So. Yeah, that it is. Yeah, you can get some beautiful recycled um, countertops, or at least like the content. Yeah. Um, also, a great material that's kind of up and coming right now is called mycelium. And there's a photo actually of, of a uh, a lamp. Let me, yeah, thank you. Go back yeah. to where it is. Is that, isn't that um like fungus or mushrooms? Yeah, so it's made from mushrooms. Yeah, but it, how stunning is that lamp to be yeah. Yeah. entirely biodegradable? Um, yeah. So yeah, anything that can be made from mycelium, I think that they you can, I think they make bricks now as well, but yeah, that's a great one. Does it hold up? Does it have like a long lifespan or is it just, yeah? Because it looks very <laughs> fragile and delicate too. So. I'm not too sure of, of lifespan, but definitely entirely biodegradable, which is, is great. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, I, I, have, I have so many questions, but also we could probably just go down rabbit holes all day. So, um, but I won't keep you. So thank you again so much for joining us. I super appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been great. So that concludes our Coffee Retail Summit. Thank you to all of our speakers who joined us over these past two days. We've heard from leaders across Europe about their company's approach to coffee retail and ways to think about coffee retail in a new light. If you missed any of the talks or want to hear a talk again, we'll be uploading the recordings on the web this website, retail.sca.coffee. In the meantime, the resource library is available for you to catch up on other articles, research, or past talks curated, especially with coffee retailers in mind. We hope you've enjoyed the summit and will continue to use the Retail Summit Resource Library. Before I go, I want to do a final thanks and a final shout out to our sponsors. Our title sponsor, BWT Water and More, who provided you the resources for us to be able to bring this to you today. Also, a special thanks to our lead sponsors, Barazza and San Remo, as well as a thank you to our supporting sponsors, Frumpy and Marco. And finally, last but not least, a huge thank you to the SCA staff for hosting these talks and helping out behind the scenes. There's so many of them that you don't see, um, but they really help make the summit possible. And finally, thank you for joining us. I hope to see you soon online or in person at a coffee shop.